you have among you the documents and we have the biographies of each panelist, each speaker. Um, I think it's a gender balanced panel. And it's interesting that we're going to be talking about the international community's perspective. In the first group, we heard about the uh, situation in Venezuela and the challenge that it presents vis-a-vis uh, -vis other countries and especially in South America. In the second group, we talked about the Central American challenge, which also gives rise to a lot of concern between Costa Rica and Nicaragua. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the international perspective on migration. We, in Brussels, we are currently undergoing or having a conference, and I don't think it's uh, by any coincidence uh, that we're talking about this issue in D.C. as well. This has been uh, telling us that there is an international concern for this topic, for this issue. Federica Moreno, who is the ministry, uh, Minister of uh, Foreign Relations in Brussels, stated this morning this is phenomenon that we've seen in the Americas is the largest displacement of people in Latin America and the Caribbean. And I want to really highlight this. It's the largest displacement of, hum of people in the Americas. And obviously it has to have a response beyond any individual country's efforts. Uh, a few minutes ago we were talking about how some of these people were being absorbed into the countries and the migration that we're seeing in this region has seen a, a certain, uh, perhaps not a certain focus or a dramatic focus, like we don't see refugee camps in these areas. There's not a serious crisis as we have seen in, uh, occurring in Europe. However, it must be stated that it is dramatic and it is noteworthy in terms of how uh, women and children are being treated and the kinds of basic services that they're receiving, the health care that they're getting. Uh, a few months ago in Madrid there was a conference on migration in which the mayor of Madrid was saying, well, we wouldn't know what to do if we have 30,000 children arriving to our city because we don't have a way of uh, being able to attend so many uh, children to such a mass migration flow. And what we've seen in our region is uh, truly impactful. In Colombia, we have 1.4 million people arriving. In Ecuador, 300,000 people have been arriving. In Peru, 850,000 migrants. Chile, 270,000 people. And just Venezuelans alone. So can you imagine if this problem, which is a diaspora that we're witnessing from Venezuela due to a series of internal factors that we're not going to go into right now, but this is showing us that there is a need to truly create uh, the international community support. And that's why we're here sitting together to be able to discuss what is occurring. A few days ago there was an article uh, or they were talking about the uh, uh, budget that was established to cover this uh, uh, contingency and this emergency. It's, but they haven't been able to um, get those, not even half of the budget that was uh, proposed, which was over $700 million. Billion. I mean, so President Santos, two months before uh, leaving power, Say, and uh, he said something that was uh, really um, caught my attention. The problem of vi Venezuelan migration is the main problem of Colombia. And they created, they said half a point of the GDP of its country is what this uh, crisis is generating. And similar studies have been done in Ecuador and in Peru with the World Bank. The numbers are not in yet, or at least the final numbers, but we are seeing the need to truly approach this from uh, a different point, that we need to provide these basic services to these uh, migrants and immigrants. We have an inc interesting panel with us today who are going to be addressing 
not only uh, the perspectives from the United Nations and from the OIS, but also from the Department of State. We're in D.C., and we're here in the headquarters. So I think it'll be very interesting to be able to talk about uh, these issues with them. We have Chiara Cardoletti Carroll, who is the Deputy Regional Representative of the uh, High Commissioner of the United Nations for the Refugees for the United States and uh, for the America and the Caribbean for the UNCHR. And with the IMO, they are the ones leading um, this topic. Well, if you allow, I'm going to speak in English. It's going to be easier for me. Start. I wanted to sort of recall the numbers because it is really from there that, that we can understand the impact that uh, this, uh, this massive, massive exodus is having on the countries that are being impacted by it. So we keep on hearing, uh, of course, about the 4.5 million who have left Venezuela. Uh, which is, of course, uh, the largest exodus that has ever been seen by the continent, ever been seen by UNHCR for sure, um, and the most rapid uh, exodus that has been seen so far. Um, but what we do not talk about is also um, about the 4.2 million people that are regularly benefiting from the, 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 the mobility card that Colombia has issued to Venezuelans residing inside Venezuela by making themselves available of this card to be able to go in and out uh, and therefore somewhat maintaining uh, um, sort of their anchor inside Venezuela. We also have half a million people who have returned back from Venezuela into, into their countries, people who had either sort of asylum or were residing in Venezuela. So again, a big, big chunk of people who have returned home primarily to Colombia. And of course, there is also a large number of third country nationals, those numbers are undefined, uh, but they also present quite a, an important uh, challenge in terms of how we, we manage that. So these are staggering number for any continent, but certainly in a continent that has not seen large movements of people uh, for a very long period of time was even more uh, overwhelming and surprising in terms of how we respond to it. Um, obviously, um, um, have not, se not having seen a, a war or a civil conflict for a very long time, the continent was not ready to respond to a crisis of this nature from an asylum perspective. Um, and still remains uh, very much in, in challenge in terms of responding in that way. Um, and so um, we have very much worked closely with the, the countries affected, IOM, etc., to look at alternative statuses, um, even for people who may have uh, protection needs. So what are we most concerned about at the moment? We are most concerned about that we have seen an incredibly show solidarity by the countries of the region. You know, it was solidarity, I think, that has been unprecedented, um, I say worldwide. Um, and a solidarity that, of course, has maxed out the capacities of the governments involved. Um, if you think about the fact that today um, um, a Colombian uh, child sits in a classroom that is double the size that it was yesterday or spends, uh, uh, you know, uh, three, four hours more in a hospital waiting to be treated simply because the capacity has been maxed out. These are obviously an important sign of solidarity, but also is showing the cracks of what, you know, the, such a large magnitude of people is placing on countries. So that's the first challenge. A, a, a huge solidarity, but also huge, uh, huge um, um, uh, sort of over, overburdened uh, systems that are struggling to cope. Um, we are very worried about the fact, which you just mentioned earlier, the fact that this is perhaps one of the most underfunded crises in the world. And that's not a joke. It is really <laughs> one of the most underfunded, the largest and yet the most underfunded. And obviously, uh, this is creating uh, challenges for the humanitarian community to intervene, but most importantly for the governments themselves who have spent billions um, in responding to the needs of Venezuela. So that's really important to put forward. The third challenge is the regional, regional stability of the, of, the con of, the, of the continent. With such large numbers of people on the move, um, with obviously a different variety of of, of, uh, of criminality and, and, and sort of arm elements floating around, obviously, um, large number of people moving never really helps, and particularly when borders um, are, not, uh, are, not, uh, are not free to move. People start using smugglers and traffickers, etc., etc., and that obviously fuels criminal networks and, and destabilizes further already a challenge region. So that's a big concern. And of course, for us, from a UNHCR perspective, a concern is how do we continue to maintain that solidarity? 
solidarity open? How do we make sure that uh, uh, while countries have absolutely the right to control their borders and manage their borders, how do we make sure that people can continue to find protection that are very much seeking? And how do we support governments in doing that? That is a huge, huge challenge for, for, for all of us. And I, I just wanted to put it out there. Um, obviously, xenophobia uh, is, has become, uh, you know, with, the, with rhetorics and populist um, sort of conversation going on, everything has become the fault of the Venezuelan these days. You know, a person is killed and all of a sudden it's a Venezuelan problem. Uh, the economy is, is, is faltering, it's a Venezuelan problem. So obviously it's easy, given the magnitude of the problem, to blame the Venezuelan for that. But obviously there are much more complex uh, situations at hand that need to be handled other than just the Venezuelans who obviously bring all also huge amount of skills and, and, and contribute to society in a, in a very real manner. Um, so what are we doing? And uh, uh, Luca will talk uh, much more in depth about that. Um, UNHCR and IOM have been tasked by the Secretary General to work closely to coordinate the response of the international community and to work closely with governments in managing this crisis. So Luca will talk a lot about that. Uh, just to say that what we practically do uh, as a UNHCR, from a UNHCR's perspective, is coordinate the response, which has involved today 16 countries and over 113 partners. We obviously directly intervene as UNHCR in uh, responses uh, that are ranging from the training of uh, and capacity building of our government counterparts on asylum and border uh, and sort of everything that is uh, um, identifying vulnerabilities at borders to working on education. Uh, for example, in the Caribbean, we're very active on that, to pro providing cash to a whole host of uh, humanitarian response initiatives that we are underway. And thirdly, um, we very much have uh, worked uh, very hard in working with the countries in the region on the famous Quito process that Luca will describe uh, in depth and is practically aiming at supporting 14 country governments in the region to um, look at best practices and challenges and how best to harmonize the response, the good practices that have been uh, identified in, in certain, some of these countries in order to respond in a much more harmonious way to, to, to the needs of Venezuelans. So that's a little bit, and finally, and, and very much uh, going back to uh, what the moderator was saying, um, raising the visibility of the Venezuela situation. The Solidarity Conference going, currently underway has been sponsored by UNHCR and IOM and of course the international community at large very much to say much more needs to be done here. It cannot just be the countries in the region. Um, we have to step up and we have to make sure that we can bring more uh, to, to the table. Thank you. Gracias. Eh, vamos a... Thank you. We're going to address the issue of uh, the regional problems that we're seeing that there are uh, lower growth rates. Poverty decreased uh, uh, significantly in the past few years from the 2000. We went from 44 percent to 2014 to 28.5 percent. But in 2014 on, the uh, rate of poverty began to increase by two points. Uh, given that there was a, a slower economy. So from the IOMO's perspective, and Luca de Loglio uh, headed that uh, organization here in D.C., how can we uh, also reflect upon how international cooperation is needed within a framework of uh, legal and poverty challenges that leads to this displacement of uh, peoples. Hi, for convening this uh, uh, very interesting and timely uh, event here in Washington that echoes the conference, Solidarity Conference is just closing in Brussels today and I think uh, many of the issues are, are those who are on our, on our agenda. It's important that uh, Brussels has reaffirmed that uh, innovative approaches that have been developed to cope with this crisis are to be invested on. And uh, the, Chiara, you refer to the Quito process. It's very important. Uh, in two weeks' time in Bogota, there will be the, next, the fifth meeting of the Quito process. Brussels has indicated that this is a mechanism to invest on. 
The European Union has launched a political process of support, the friends of the Quito process, countries that will be supporting politically and hopefully also uh, financially and technically the, the process are lining up. And I think we have this configuration uh, is, is important because offers, as you said, uh, Chiara, the technical level uh, support that is required to harmonize a response across such a large geographical areas, countries so uneven in their, in their capacities, in their population mass, in their intake of Venezuelan uh, refugees and migrants need to find a common thread to harmonize their, their response. This is an extreme challenge in any circumstances, even in the EU context we saw how uneven was the response of the European Union countries when we were, you know, the large inflows from, uh, from Turkey, from uh, across the Mediterranean. Can you imagine how complex it is in a context like uh, uh, the Western Hemisphere, Caribbean countries, Central American countries, and South American countries, so, so different in terms of capacity, resources, population mass. You know, language is important, but it's not the only factor that can, you know, coalesce this issue. So, uh, we recognize that at the moment, uh, you know, the solidarity among the countries has been something to, to recognize, appreciate, but we also can, can see that in the last few months, these solidarities have been challenged by objective uh, situations of uh, budgetary constraints that have been exhausted, um, security concerns that are, are, are real, and, and this provokes, uh, you know, may provoke resentment, and the resentment can shape in terms of, of uh, uh, discrimination or, or xenophobia or worse. But the issue is really to, to, to address this by having a comprehensive look at both the communities absorbing uh, refugees and migrants as well as the uh, capacities to invest in the creation of uh, more durable solutions. As the crisis prolongs, as the vulnerability increases, unfortunately the resources remain stagnant and, and this is, uh, is a mismatch. So uh, the challenge I think for the international humanitarian community is, uh, is to reach out and to engage and, and include in the response developmental partners, uh, international financial institutions, uh, other, other processes that can join hands and help address some of the longer term uh, con issues linked to finding durable solutions, in, in to finding uh, investment and job opportunities for the population at large, not Venezuelans, yes, but also, uh, of course, the resident populations. We saw that in certain instances the UM has been playing a very important role in factoring the, these inflows into the development plans of the countries concerned. As, as a UN system we work in conjunction with the, with the countries in having something that we call the UN Development Cooperation Framework, which is a, a, an exercise that projects developmental needs over a period of time, and in a number of situations, these inflows are becoming part of this exercise. This is very important because we need to have, first of all, common assessments, uh, common tools, and harmonized vision. So this is the capacity that the UN can bring to, to this aspect. The second challenge, of course, is the, the documentation. Uh, it is laudable that the countries have been accepting uh, whatever documents Venezuelans are showing up with, even uh, expired passports or other documents. But the issue is that the, uh, there is the, the necessity to create a new forms of documentation that will be agile and will be allowing for the mobility of, of, the, of the Venezuelans is paramount. Mobility means mobility across the countries, mobility means mobility of uh, relatives, family unification, mobility implies also the possibility to, uh, exactly, to move without going through a process of repetition of perhaps the same mechanism from country to country, but however, a central database that is recognized and is accepted. It's a major challenge. 
the UN cannot uh, issue documents and uh, we do not want to, um, but we need to find some solutions here. And I think some ideas that have been circulated in the Quito process linked to perhaps using uh, the vaccination cards are not just useful because you avoid that children are vaccinated more than once crossing borders, but also uh, perhaps are the embryo of some document that will not challenge, uh, if you like, uh, institutional aspects, but will be uh, factually uh, helpful. Um, well, uh, this, I said that this crisis is unique in many respects. It's also unique in the way the UN has been, uh, has been uh, uh, setting up its architecture to respond to it. We have uh, a, a new figure. This is a joint special representative uh, of IOM and UNHCR, that is uh, Mr. Ricardo Stein, uh, well-navigated politicians, which is doing an extremely helpful uh, job in advocating for humanitarian response, in uh, trying to harmonize in the response from country to country and sustaining uh, the Quito process insofar as the UN concerned and uh, raising awareness. So uh, we appreciate his figure and underneath there is this uh, uh, in regional interagency coordination platform that has been set up in Panama, where the capacities of both agencies in various sectors, uh, we call them clusters, but it's not just IUM and UNHCR, it also brings together a number of other international partners from within the UN and outside the UN, and is duplicated at the national level. This, again, is a unique arrangement, as I was recalling, the need to harmonize the response, but the platform is, a, is both an assessment mechanism, a fundraising tool, and a strategic uh, uh, vision that is, uh, is uh, filtered through at the national level and support process, political process, such as the Quito process. So these three elements, I think, are important for the response. I think have been recognized in, in Brussels. Soon there will be the new uh, regional uh, refugees and migrant response plan for 2020 will be launched. It will be launched in Bogota in two weeks' time. I cannot, I don't know exactly how many millions this, uh, uh, so, uh, and we hope that, 1.3 billion. So that, uh, that gives you the idea of the magnitude of the challenge. And since we are in this room, I would like to acknowledge and uh, thank PRM for the very consistent and general support that has been provided to in response to this crisis. Thank you very much. <laughs> So we have, uh, this is first news here, given the um, perspective of the Department of State of the United States with regards to these migration flows in Latin America, obviously this is nothing new for the United States. We have seen these migration trends in uh, these uh, countries now. It's more a tendency that we see in towards the south. What is the United States, uh, Department of State's um, perspective, outlook on this situation? What are the main aspects that the Department of State uh, considers in light of this uh, situation? that we all share in the region? Big questions. Yes. Um, thank you to the Migration Policy Institute for the invitation to speak and for putting this together. It's a little daunting to be the embodiment of the U.S. government here, so maybe I'll start talking about our, the U.S. government response with a personal anecdote that I think illustrates a little bit the magnitude of the, how quickly the crisis developed with Venezuela. In the summer of 2014, I was posted um, as a foreign service officer to Bogota, and my job was to be the regional refugee coordinator, primarily working on U.S. assistance to the Colombian situation. And before I left Washington, I was told by the State Department 
the Columbia situation seems to be winding down, the peace <laughs> process is going well, you might well be the last regional refugee coordinator that we post to the Western Hemisphere. <laughs> so fast forward to today and we still have a, a ref court in Bogota, we've created a new position in Quito, we've created a new position in Mexico City and we're about to add a fourth one in Panama City. So. Um, there is a lot of work to be done. We had been watching the situation develop in Venezuela for many years, and there seemed to be kind of an extraordinary ability of Venezuelans to absorb scarcity and difficulty. Um, and it just, you know, people would come into Colombia for the day and they would get goods and health services and go back. But eventually the tipping point was reached and as has been discussed, the numbers are, are really tremendous at this point. In terms of the United States government response on the humanitarian front, um, we have had a significant increase in our assistance budget. Since fiscal 2017, which was three years ago, we've just started fiscal 2020, the U.S. government has given more than $650 million to the Venezuela crisis response. And our assistance flows through our institutional partners, um, UNHCR and IOM, along with ICRC and NGOs, um, are how we are funding the crisis. Looking forward, one of the questions that you asked us to address is what more needs to be done. The answer is a lot, but let me focus on a few things. Um, as has already been mentioned, there's, there's just a need for more international funding. The regional response plan has been less than half funded and the Solidarity Conference that's, that took place today in Brussels, we hope will raise the profile and raise future donor contributions. In terms of sectoral response, one of the things that the, the U.S. government is focusing some of our efforts on this coming year are child protection and also gender-based violence protection and response where we see a lot of gaps. And additionally, we are working with the governments in the region to strengthen asylum capacity and asylum institutions. A lot of the countries in the region were traditionally exporters of refugees and displaced persons and didn't necessarily have the systems in place to receive asylum seekers. So we are working um, with them on that. And I think the most important thing I want to say about the Venezuelan situation is that while the U.S. government has responded, we think robustly, it's primarily the countries of the region that have really stepped up and they deserve an enormous amount of credit and thanks um, in terms of their extraordinary generosity, which has, has really been amazing. I don't know if you want me to keep my comments just to Venezuela, but I think I, I'll say just a couple of things about Nicaragua if I could. Um, it's an important but I think a little bit overlooked crisis in the region, especially now that, that Venezuela has taken up so much of the, the oxygen. Um, but we are concerned about Nicaragua, and even though it's not in the news as much as it was last year, we feel that the regime's um, campaign of repression continues relatively unabated. And again, it's the, you know, it's the regional countries that have stepped up, and Costa Rica in particular has seen the majority of asylum seekers. And we commend Costa Rica for its improvements in their refugee status determination systems, there are additional safeguards that ensure protections for unaccompanied minors, GBV survivors, victims of trafficking and smuggling. But with a population of only four and a half million people and with not only Nicaraguans but asylum seekers and arrivals from a variety of countries, um, Costa Rica really can't do it alone. So we have, again, increased our, our funding to UNHCR and to NGOs, most of whom we were originally funding for Venezuelan and Colombian response, but we've also allowed them to, to respond to the Nicaraguans as well. Um, and I think I will stop there. Thank you.
Gracias. Eh, el, el año pasado, la Comisión... Last year, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights issued a resolution in March where it addressed the importance that states address this massive migration phenomena. That is to say, not to close their borders and to also address the issue of refugees. This important declaration by the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights provides a framework under which certain supervision has been done in the region. This is an important point to highlight in the OAS, in the context of the OAS. And now we're going to hear from Betilde Muñoz, who's, uh, who works at the OAS, and she heads the Social Inclusion Department at the Organization of American States. And the OAS, of course, has been doing more than the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, and it will be very important to hear, acknowledge what they have been doing. Go ahead, Betilde. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. You were part of the OAS family, and it's good to reconnect with you. I would like to begin by talking about why the OAS has been paying so much attention to these two uh, protect, uh, migration crises. From the OAS and the Social Inclusion Department, we have recommended to work on migration, uh, forced displacement, and refugees, but there are three crises that take up the majority of our time and that we are permanently monitoring and for which we have developed different work mechanisms. One, of course, is the massive displacement of millions of Venezuelans, 4.5 million to be precise, followed by Nicaraguans going to Costa Rica and obviously Central American traveling up north, for which we work in close coordination with the UNHCR. Why are these crises important and why do we monitor them and follow up on them? Well, first, because it's in a, it has to do with protection. Behind each one of those thousands of Nicaraguans or millions of Venezuelans, we like to talk about, you know, large numbers, but everybody has a history, everybody has a family, uh, a person. And at the OAS, both from the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, the Secretary General and the community of countries that are part of the OAS, we understand that these people uh, have to be protected internationally, so therefore we have the responsibility to protect them. Second. I would like to mention, and I believe that the panels that spoke before us have already referred to this, the majority of this population has concentrated, in the case of Venezuelans, around uh, South America, about 80% of them, in countries in the southern cone, and in the case of Nicaraguans, mostly in Costa Rica. And the countries that are absorbing these migration flows were not really prepared to handle these uh, large volumes of people. But, and apparently these flows will not stop anytime soon. So not addressing the situation is leaving these countries uh, alone, which have proven to be solidary, pragmatic, and to the extent of their possibilities have been addressing the needs of these people that get to their countries. Third, and I believe that somebody mentioned this um, when they were talking about Nicaraguan displacement, even though this is not a direct mandate as part of a social inclusion portfolio, we address the issue of crimes associated with massive displacement of people. Of course, we're talking worry about human smuggling, trafficking in migrants, and in the case of Venezuelans uh, near the Colombian border, recruiting of Venezuelan young people for illegal purposes, uh, mostly organized crime and all the vulnerabilities associated to the majority of these people being uh, irregular migrants. So from the point of view of security, even if it's not part of our mandate, it has a human dimension and therefore we address it. And maybe when we ask about why uh, provide care, significant data has been shown about the economic contribution they make to our countries, but also the social and cultural the contributions that these people can make. We need to focus on how to make countries um, aware of uh, devising the right 
public policies to make the best of these migration. So even in the short term they could pose challenges, in the long term it would be highly beneficial for host countries. And finally I think we should talk about some of the topics that should be on our agenda to start changing this short term approach uh, and make it more medium to long term because this migration flow is not going to stop anytime soon. The issue of regularization is key. Uh, a lot of them are regular migrants and the countries have been given the response. There's an option of asylum for Nicaraguans, which seems to be the preferred mode. But it is important to continue to support our countries in order for them to devise a harmonized response options because they are the port of entry in order for them, for the migrants to enjoy the rest of the rights and also to prevent uh, these people from becoming even more vulnerable. As it is, they are vulnerable. Another thing that I would like to mention is the need to start thinking about this with an intersectoral approach by putting together different government agency portfolios and provide joint answers, you know, health, education, social development, etc. And so we have the, the Border Inheritance Office in Colombia, which has an interesting model because it not only takes government response, but it also tries to tap into international cooperation in order to uh, provide intersectoral responses. I think this is a very good practice that hopefully will be emulated. It is already being done in some of the countries, but hopefully it will be strengthened. And in the case of Costa Rica, they are using it for Nicaraguans. Third, they need to think about uh, work inclusion or labor inclusion policies. It has been mentioned, but I would also like to highlight that the OAS has been devising a response in this regard in cooperation with the ILO, uh, the International Migration Office, and FAO, thinking that uh, humanitarian responses must be kept. They are key because these uh, population uh, flows are sick. They are not vaccinated, they have low economic means, so we need to start switching our approach and see how we're going to make them integrate into the new host country in the long term. And finally, in terms of international support, I liked what Luca said in terms that there are large volumes of people, lots of needs, but that does not match the response that we have received so far. The data from what we have received in terms of funding illustrate this, but we need to start thinking about adding the development uh, perspective of the countries that are receiving these migrants and especially address the needs of migrant and refugee populations because they are vulnerable, but also think about what happens with the host communities because they can also prevent xenophobia and discrimination. And if that goes unattended in their wrong uh, run, uh, it will uh, become worse uh, in the long term and it will affect social cohesion in these countries. The moderator, thank you, Betilde. With that, we're going to move on to the second round and before open it up for questions, I would like to mention another message that we heard in Brussels and Eduardo Stein, special representative, said that the Venezuelan problem will go from 4.5 million people to 6.5 million people in 2020. That's next year. This is a, a red flag for us in terms of us needed to mobilize our countries in the continent to see what we can do together. The most important agencies for this are obviously UN, HCR, and the migration organization, but we need to see how the two agencies that are organizations that are the ultimate responsible can develop better synergies in order to work on these t areas that are too much, that are overwhelming government resources. Yesterday we had a meeting with migration offices that have these issues and they were saying that they were truly overwhelmed and they had to go into emergency mode. Imagine what this has meant for Colombia, for Peru, or for Ecuador currently when we talk about regularizing the migratory migra migration status of hundreds of thousands of people. A migrant needs ID. 
needs to be a regular citizen in order for he or she to have access to services and, of course, have a job. And this, and I heard this from Andrew Sellers a couple months ago, and I found this kind of surprising. He says that the response from the host countries in Latin America has been extremely positive, extremely creative, and low cost as well, because these efforts took place with pretty much the same resources they had before. In the case of Peru, you were able to regularize like half a million people with those temporary permits. In the case of Colombia, the figures are similar. So these are the government, these are government efforts. And, and one more thing, these are governments that did not historically have the practice of receiving massive flows of agreements. So they had to learn as they go, uh, you know, to see how to address these migration flows. So what kind of responses do we get from international organizations in order to help countries be more, much more effective than what they've proven to be so far? Carol, go ahead. Um, to add another little element to the, to the, not to the panic, I don't think that's a word, but to the, to the worry, is that we're talking about 6.5 without considering all those who are irregular or who have no regular status, because 6.5 are only those who are currently being counted by the government. So that's just to give you that the scope is much, much larger. So that's, that's point, no, not the first point. The second point is that, um, what, the, what, in, what IOM and UNHCR, together with the rest of the international community, has put together, sort of this regional platform, um, is perhaps the largest effort in the world if, in terms of geographical coverage, there's over 16 countries, and in terms of partners. I mean, having 113 partners that appeal directly to uh, the international community for funding, in addition to those who are already working with UNHCR, IOM, etc., it's, it's unprecedented. We have never um, launched a, a sort of a, a, a coordinated uh, strategy uh, and, and appeal for funding uh, before in history. So I think that in terms of uh, setting the priorities, setting the vision, setting the strategy, uh, making sure that there is a coordinated response amongst the other actors, I think that that is certainly um, what we have so far been able to do, and I think it's, it's quite extraordinary. Now, what is the problem here is that obviously you can have the best vision in the world and the best set of activities and the best set of relationship with the government, but if the response is not fully funded, and if it wasn't for the US government, quite frankly, we would be in, 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 in really in serious problems right now. Um, activities are, are just going to remain sort of a, a plan of action that doesn't actually get. But I do believe that, uh, that in terms of where we should be going, the direction is the right one. I think it just needs to be supported much more wholeheartedly by the international community. The Quito process is also, as Luca was saying, an unprecedented mechanism. It's not a talk show. Uh, it's not a, a room where people sit down and talk about uh, the problems of Venezuela. It's actually a, a, a forum that really looks at what can we do exactly and precisely for the issue that you were referring earlier? What can we do about documentation? Um, how do we make sure that kids don't get vaccinated four, five, six, seven times as they, as they move across the, across the, the continent? And the, the, the issuance and the decision of having a regional uh, vaccination, vaccination card was quite an, an important achievement in that sense. But everything from how do we go about managing the, 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 the sort of the arrivals at border in a, more, in a more coherent manner, in a more structured manner, how do we manage asylum system better? How do we manage the health response uh, in, in, a, in a much more robust manner? And how can we support governments in doing that? And I think what's really been interesting here is that Again, it's not just government sitting down there. It's not just the UN sitting there. It's really the international financial institution. The World Bank is sitting there. The Inter-American Bank is sitting there. The European Union is sitting there. The US government is sitting there to really listen from the governments what are the challenges and how can best can be supported. So I'm not saying we cannot do more or we should not be doing more, but in terms of what has the architecture that has been put in place, it's certainly a very innovative and strong one. What is lacking at the moment is the financial commitment commitment to help the region, the international community through the UN agencies and, 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 the, and the various partners but, and the governments themselves in absorbing uh, an enormous amount of people that, as, uh, as Batilda was saying, all have a, has a life and a history and a need behind. Um, and perhaps uh, just one additional point is the 
one of the one of the key challenges at the moment for us is very much women and children. It's the the real serious phenomenon of trafficking of women and girls uh, throughout the continent. The Caribbean being a real big uh, problem, and so that is something that we are very much struggling with because obviously it has you know a human component, a financial component, but also also a sort of a how do you manage the, the, the criminality angle associated with that. So it's a very complex issue that I think we still have to grapple with in a much more uh, robust matter. Thank you. Oops. Luca. Uh, very briefly, uh, two, two issues I would like to stress. One is that uh, this uh, forecast that uh, the number, the millions of Venezuelans will be moving from 5.5 to 6.5 on whom 5.5 perhaps in this continent will add another million basically of people to, the, to this exodus. And this, if you see how the resources are being allocated to cope, cope with this crisis, is very interesting because we had a projection where we had four baskets. One is direct assistance, you know, the humanitarian support, the shelter, the health, the nutrition, the, 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 you know, the, immediate, the immediate response. Then there is the protection element, which includes also documentation and legal support also. Then the third one is the socioeconomic and cultural integration. You know, the issue that we are discussing here in terms of, well, what kind of livelihood, how people can become self-sufficient. And the last is the uh, capacity building of the governments to keep themselves with, there is, with, the, with the tools, the herramientas. Now, you would expect that after it, you know, a few years, the, the, the socioeconomic aspect was started to become more and more relevant, more prominent. Unfortunately, the continuous exodus of people makes the imperative need to devote a substantial number of resources to direct immediate or direct assistance, which remains almost a 50% of what has been provided by the international community, leaving protection with 15%, uh, socioeconomic and cultural integration to 25-30%, and the country's capacity 10%. We should change this, this redistribution of resources, but the continuous access challenges this and makes it almost impossible. So this, I think, is a, is a very... Uh, critical issues and it goes in the direction that we are you know, saying here that the best way of, of uh, maintaining the solidarity is to, to increase the capacity of the communities in terms of absorption and also to address the local, the local employment issues that are pertaining to the whole population. The second issue is that without documentation, the people resort to you know, irregular movement mechanisms, the risk for smuggling and trafficking and all the consequences associated to, you know, to the vulnerabilities, you know, gender-based violence are there, they are going to get worse, also because the situation at the border between Venezuela and Colombia is unfortunately deteriorating, and the space that is remaining outside of the control of the international community, the issue of access is becoming, you know, becoming more and more complex and, and worse. This is, of course, goes beyond the humanitarian issue and entails other other security elements, but I think it's, it's becoming a destabilizing factor that can reverse all the progress that has been achieved in the last few years. Thank you. Luca nos habla de desestabilización. Mm -hmm. eh, lo... Luca is talking about, the moderator says, Luca is talking about destabilization. What does the U.S. think about this? Go ahead, Dana. There's a Venezuelans and also um, looking at the reality that many of them will be staying in these host countries for probably a number of years into the future, we are starting to think more and more about the relief to development coherence and how we look at more long-term solutions. State Department is not the provider of that, but we play a role in it as we work more closely with USAID, with the World Bank, with private sector in terms of helping refugees and migrants find livelihoods and employment, um, and also trying to support the host communities as well so that all the benefits don't flow to the, to the refugees, but also recognizing that the host communities need to be supported um, through the process. Okay, thank you. Uh, the moderator says, Matt Betilde 
In your previous remarks, you were talking about security issues that happen mainly along the Colombian and Venezuelan border. In Central America, the issue of security is one of the root causes for migration, mostly the Northern Triangle, in addition to, of course, corruption, poverty, lack of opportunities, etc. There's a series of factors, by the way. But in going back to what you were saying, is the OAS working on developing some kind of opportunities or fora for governments to talk about this it, that can be connected to integral development? Is there that connection? Betilde, from the point of view of the security pillar at the OAS, we have been working on a project that could be replicated in other situations as well, in everything uh, uh, that has to do with migration-related crimes. Obviously, working with, the, with law enforcement and security forces in the countries to see how to best address the situation from the social inclusion portfolio. We, of course, have a different outlook on things. And in this sense, I wanted to highlight the work that we have been fostering and initiatives that we're thinking about supporting the humanitarian efforts by the UNHCR and IOM. One of them has to do with the kind of responses that are being provided from the social development sector to address victims of trafficking in persons. We are working with the IOM and in and we talked with Diego Beltran, the IO, IOM representative for Latin America, talked about this, uh, together with the mandate in our Quito process work plan for the OAS and the IOM to work to specifically on this area. That is to say, with a more social approach f uh, f uh, and more people focused uh, to address the victims of trafficking in persons. Second, in our point of view, and t Luca talked about the better distribution of resources, but we believe it's also very important to pay attention to local authorities, you know, mayors or local governments, what kind of responses they are given, because they are there in the front line addressing the needs of the people and provide them with dignified housing, uh, give them water, or giving them having the children enrolled in school or providing access to health services and we're also trying to foster not only a meeting of local authorities to share protocols, experiences and lessons learned along the way but also to develop a more permanent exchange mechanism between and among these authorities with the idea of uh, having responses be better and more sophisticated. And in that regard and also going back to the work inclusion issue, there's a lot of ongoing initiatives, you know, programs to foster entrepreneurship, not only for Venezuelans, but for Nicaraguans as well. In the case of Nicaraguans, the Costa Rican minister talked about this project to receive a Nicaraguans in Costa Rica that has a very important entrepreneurship and community work component to also create opportunities at the community level. But trying to tailor it to the Venezuelan migration reality and to and the way the Venezuelan diaspora has organized itself in Argentina. For those who are not familiar with the case of Venezuelans in Argentina, they have kind of, you know, created, unionized themselves. They have created an association of Venezuelan psychologists, the same for doctors, etc for all the professions and we believe this is a very this is a best practice that could be uh, emulated to put them in contact with other asso professional associations in their host countries in order and also to talk with the government in order to have you know degree recognition so they can you know practice their professions in the local government. So this is another thing that we're trying to do in order to achieve more empowerment among the displaced people. Moderator says we have 12 minutes to ask questions and get answers. So we have two here. Go ahead, please. Hi. <coughs> the presentation and for the panel. My name is Joy Olson. I'm a consultant to the Open Society Policy Center. Um, and I have two questions. One is when do you think, well, I, the first one is based on uh, 
we all seem to get the the level of magnitude of the Syrian refugee crisis. I mean, in in kind of international visibility and the feeling of crisis. Um, people don't have that feeling of crisis around Venezuela. So why do you think that is, one? Uh, two, when do you think the number, more or less, month-wise, if your projections hold, when does the number of Venezuelan refugees surpass the number of Syrians? And um, third, uh, the U.S. government just got a little creative with the extension of the temporary protected status for Salvadorans. Um, uh could they do the same thing for Venezuelans? Um, I mean, I, I would assume they could since they kind of, uh, they were flexible around the TPS for Salvadoran. So uh, could you address that? We'll see. We'll see. Gracias. Uh, in relation Thank you. With regards to the keto process, I have a question. Because even though obviously it's an interesting process and, and somehow we're all working on it, I think it is slightly weakened in terms of institutions, in terms of transparency and participation. So I would like to know what are the different efforts made from the several agencies so that civil society and our contributions as people who work with immigrants, everyday migrants, everyday are be are allowed to be part of the process. Unfortunately, it's not a guaranteed participation for civil society to be part of it. Last time, we only had 30 minutes in the Quito process meeting, and I don't know if Colombia is going to be able to honor that or if, under which condition. I think the standards for participation uh, from the OAS and the United Nations. Uh, that they allow the, um, the civil society organization could be something that could be honored also in the keto process. So what kind of measures are you taking to address that? Thank you for uh, your response. My name is Akshay Valia. Uh, so I had a question uh, basically uh, based on like since the Cartagena Declaration uh, gives an expanded definition of a refugee for uh, basically gross uh, human rights violations or any other actions that lead to the uh, disruption of public order. Uh, and uh, there was actually like a UNHCR um, experts panel in 2013, which actually made it, uh, we interpreted it to be relevant uh, for for this broader definition. Uh, and since many of the countries you're talking about were actually signatories for the Cartan Declaration, uh, could you talk more about how uh, is there any progress and what's what, how is basically the process of seeing whether all Venezuelans can be classified under the Catherine Declaration to be getting refugee benefits, and how does that relate to the Guito process, if there's something in there for that. Thank you. One more, because then we have to cl uh, close. We only have seven minutes left. Thank you to the first question. I just would like to understand better about the Syria-like uh, crisis, I just would like to understand better why there is lack of funding on Venezuela. Both of you, two of you mentioned that issue, and I just want to understand why there is not enough. Why is it on the, on the budget crisis? Why this is, I mean, what, what are the reasons behind it? Okay, who's going to answer? Chiara, Luca? Luca, uh, yes, but I would say that on the on the on the fund, I mean, the Venezuela versus Syria. I mean, uh, this is very painful to to think of uh, of the similar differences in this crisis. Clearly, uh, Syria had you know, open warfare, massive internal displacement, and, and so many other terrible related issues that somewhat are. Uh, uh, you know, not thing. even though there are some um, elements of displacement in Venezuela not as dramatic as the Syria crisis. But in terms of, of uh, my entire response, I think the pattern is the same. Uh, if you look at the map of uh, the UN appeal 
we have usually a, a response that is about 60%, 50% of the response globally. So uh, Venezuela is no exception. And perhaps the expectations of the countries of the region were better equipped than, mm -hmm. uh, than uh, you know, other traditional humanitarian crises is also uh, slow the pace of the response as well as the issues of, uh, of considering that this happens in the Western Hemisphere has given to the European Union not the same level of uh, stimulus. I hope that the Solidarity Conference that has been organized now will uh, ignite some more sense of urgency on the part of the EU institutions and member states. And this is also linked to the issues of the Quito process, how this uh, uh, renewed commitment to support the specific uh, mechanisms will translate in terms of uh, uh, participation, in more inclusive participation in terms of more effective uh, uh, support for the countries and more uh, action-oriented follow-up because the number of issues are on the agenda of the Quito process has been there for quite some time without uh, any, any specific solution. So I hope that uh, the initiatives that have been taken in Brussels, including the creation of this, uh, the friends of the Quito process will uh, ignite some, some responses. Uh, along what uh, Luca was um, talking about, in Venezuela's case, and Costa Rica, in terms of receiving the Nicaraguans and a little bit, Moises, the question that you're asking. And I'm, Andrew, I'm going to cite what you, um, or quote what you said earlier this morning. The countries of Latin America are being victims of their own capabilities and of their resilience in terms of addressing uh, the situations and doing so in an effective manner. So somehow, up to a certain point, that sense of urgency was actually taken care of by the countries who are providing the solutions. And I think that's one element. Costa Rica, with the volume of cases that they're seeing of migrants who are seeking a refugee status, they're taking care of it. They're taking care of that problem. And secondly, we also have this um, thinking that this is just a re regional issue, that Venezuelans are just staying in South American countries. Most Nicaraguans are being displaced because of the uh, migra migratory uh, trends towards Costa Rica, especially in Costa Rica and Nicaragua. You see that this is something that's normally, that, that's normal, that's something that it's applies only to that region. And when we, when we talk about Central America, we see, you know, there are integrated regions, so sometimes I think these are the two elements that add on to, to what uh, Lu uh, Luca was uh, talking about. And Dana? answered the question the way I would about Syria. I think when you've got open conflict and terrorism and those elements that put it in the news every night, that's, that's part of why it gets a lot more attention and also the, the response of the regional countries in, in Venezuela, I think, makes it seem less of a crisis. And TPS? It, you said could it. Yes, it could. I mean, there currently are no, are no plans to, <coughs> to offer it, but yes, it, it is a potential tool. Get up. Yeah, just perhaps to um, address directly the, the question on Cartagena. Um, UNHCR has issued uh, a couple of um, guidance documents on the international protection considerations of Venezuela over the past year and a half, um, and it specifically looked at uh, Cartagena as an instrument that, of course, was the most, um, the most uh, pertinent instrument that could be used by governments in the region um, to address the Venezuela situation. What the, our documents have, have said is that Cartagena or the principles enshrined in Cartagena. And what we are seeing is that uh, while uh, not every single Venezuelan has been given refugee status in the continent, what they have received through uh, sort of access to regular status is very much in line and similar to what we would have liked to have seen in the context of, 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 of Cartagena, access to rights, access to employment, access to education, making sure that people actually have a regular status in the country. So in a sense, the government have abided and, and adhered to what we have been recommending is that wherever possible, very much look at the principles enshrined in a very important regional instrument and adapt that to whatever legal migratory pathways you may, you may be able to put in place. So that's, that's a bit an answer to, to that question. Um, and on this refugee crisis, I think it has surpassed it already. Mm -hmm. 
in terms of numbers. Yeah. I think uh, we have um, kept ourselves during the time. Just one last comment before closing this discussion. With regards to visibility of this phenomenon, I think in the case of the Venezuelan diaspora, I don't think we see that there is violence generated from this diaspora, but nonetheless, things can change. Uh, currently, after the openness of governments to accept um, some of these uh, people, that is something that has we begin seeing. So now we see that more formal documents are being required and uh, visas for migrants. And what we see, and we need to uh, really highlight this issue, is that we are regularizing now is that there's a, uh, the arrival of immigrants in an irregular manner. So perhaps what we see then is that there are illegal ways of people who are taking advantage of these migrants and perhaps um, treat them um, in an illegal manner and they might be trafficked and so we have to be very careful in how we address this issue because the situation could become even worse very quickly because sometimes I'm left very concerned that migration maybe goes up and uh, sometimes um, this might lead to even greater problems. Well, fun. Thank you, everyone here. And for everything you're doing. And let me call forward Diego Chavez and Jessica Bolter to offer a few concluding remarks. Um, as they come up, let me say that we will be publishing Diego and Jessica and Andrea and me are part of a team that will be doing some publishing about what's going on in the region. You'll see some documents from Migration Policy Institute in the next few months. And you will also see probably towards the end of the year, the beginning of next year, a migration portal with information and documents on what's going on in the region. One of the things that is hard to track right now are statistics and information as it changes. And so we will begin to have some of that information available in a one-stop shop where you can access it. And with that, Diego Chavez, Jessica Bolter. Great. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you so much to all our fantastic panelists and moderators. Um, I'm just going to try to offer some concluding thoughts here. Based on what we've heard today, there's no simple way to sum up the responses to the mass migration flows in Latin America. Um, but a lot of the narrative, especially lately, has tended to revolve around whether Latin America is still open or whether it's closing. Um, but there's a, there's a common and unique thread kind of in this region where countries largely do want to figure out how to regularize migrants, even if there are sometimes other factors that might intervene in this goal and they're further conscious of the need to integrate migrants into society. We've seen this with uh, the temporary stay permits that both Colombia and Peru have offered, the PEP in Colombia, the PTP in Peru, which have regularized over a million Venezuelan migrants. Uh, and although it wasn't mentioned today, we've also seen it with Colombia's effort to nationalize tens of thousands of children born to Venezuelan parents in that country who, other who otherwise could have been stateless. Uh, we've seen the opening of the asylum system to Venezuelans in Mexico. Uh, we've seen the upcoming regularization of agricultural workers in Costa Rica. And we've seen the use of the Mercosur visa in Argentina and Uruguay, which Raisa has suggested could be a pathway for other countries in South America to offer regular status to uh, Venezuelans. And finally, we're now seeing the mass registration and regularization in, of Venezuelan migrants in Ecuador. At the same time, there's powerful forces on the other side, which have compelled some countries to start closing off pathways for migrants. Uh, there's turns in public opinion. Uh, there's a deep concern among governments, uh, and rightly so, about the development of xenophobia and resentment among host communities. Uh, to add to that, under-resourced systems, which were already struggling to serve host communities, are overwhelmed. As Kiara said in the last panel, uh, the solidarity of the region uh, has uh, led to it maxing out its capacity. 
Um, and finally, as we've heard over and over today, countries are facing a continued scarcity of international funding, particularly around issues of long-term solutions for migrants. So strapped for resources and in an effort to calm public anxiety, some countries have put in place things like visa requirements or have strayed away from mass regularization programs. Some countries, as an effect, have turned away from regional efforts to harmonize uh, regional policies uh, in, re in response to the demands of national politics. Uh, but even this turn toward narrow path narrower pathways isn't necessarily so simple or universal. Um, so while Chile has been largely inflexible toward Venezuelan migrants, its neighbor Argentina has maintained flexibility and openness. Peru has implemented a visa requirement for Venezuelans, uh, but it exempts vulnerable populations and people reuniting with their families. Ecuador has implemented a visa requirement, but at the same time, it announced its mass regularization program. And Colombia continues to keep its border open to Venezuelans and to encourage other countries to follow a regional approach. So it's certainly legitimate and right to debate whether these are the right or adequate responses to the situation. We know that visa requirements are leading to increased irregular migration. It's likely that access to refugee status and uh, the capacity of refugee systems will have to be uh, expanded upon. Uh, receiving countries have to think about ways to offer long-term status to migrants while avoiding generating anxiety among the public about migrants receiving benefits that they're not receiving. Uh, and there's a need for increased coordination among sectors and among institutions in society as well as among countries in the region. But as Latin America deals with massive mixed migration flows, unlike what it's dealt with in the past, countries are trying to figure, are negotiating a host of complex factors and trying to figure out what works and what doesn't. Um, the rest of the world would be well served to pay attention to what's going on in this region and to support these countries as they work on developing fair and humane policies, both for host communities and migrants. Um, and so for some thoughts on other issues the countries are facing going forward, I'll turn to my colleague Diego Chavez. Bueno, yo voy a hablar en español y... I'm going to speak in Spanish, but if it was difficult for you to sum up uh, what, what you said, I mean, with what you just summed up, it's going to be m making my job even harder to sum up. What I wanted to talk about are the lessons learned and perhaps some recommendations that could be given that um, of things that were discussed yesterday and today. And we had very interesting uh, groups of panelists and speakers. I'd like to thank Andrew again for the invitation to be here. I think what's key of all this process is that even though the probabilities is, are zero, things happen. Things can happen. And I think it's incredibly, um, it's impressive to see, despite the negative implications of migration, when you go from 4.5 million to 6.5 million of people who are going to be outside of their country for the first time in their lives, I think who would have thought that this was going to happen? But it did. And this is where I would perhaps uh, sum up what is imp important. One is that there must be a collective agreement. So we should go from, instead of discord, we should be uh, building together. We should think ahead by looking back. And I think this is uh, this creates opportunities for governments, for international cooperation, for NGOs, and for civil society to come together and to think that all decisions that are made, whether they have to do with programs uh, addressing the situation, of all the possible scenarios, there will always be one that can be talked about looking from the future back towards the past. So th perhaps at one point things where there were fears or certainties at one point will be re become responses and solutions to those fears themselves. So, and I think that's where the uh, power lies in that in terms of what can be achieved. 
I think a great lesson learned here, listening on things that we discussed, like the keto process and also the challenges of international cooperation, that should really um, not try not to excuse um, uh, illusions or hopes. We have to perhaps uh, create an appeal based on a well thought out plan, whether it comes from the NGOs and the United Nations and the government standpoints. We have to think based on this diagnosis. Well, this is what we need. We need this amount of resources to attend this kind of crisis. And going beyond uh, saying oh, it's, it's 30 percent or 20 percent, we need to think we need to think beyond that, and we need to we have to build upon what's already been built and has been built, and we have to work among agencies, among governments, and the different actors, NGOs, think tanks, and civil society, and knowing that we all share a common objective, and I think all that is important. Another issue from the first group that was addressed that was very important was xenophobia. Jose, Jose Tomas talked about an uh, a issue that was, I think was very interesting. It's like creating these narratives and to make sure that we don't fall into that trap of binary um, uh, situations. You know, we have the good, those who pair the good against the, the bad. Uh, these are the ones who do uh, good work. These are the ones who do bad work. And I think if the region itself, Latin America, itself, if it begins to uh, create their discourse on the good versus evil, then I think it can fall into uh, a, a problem. I mean, it might, um, I mean, it might fail in, in its good intentions, and I think it's, we have to really think about um, other issues. When they talked about xenophobia, when they talked about and not falling in the immediate um, solutions. We need to strengthen the uh, means of communication among the, those players in uh, this issue. And I think that is something that we have to focus on with regards to creativity, which has been a, a great challenge and uh, given to the governments and the different players of society. I think we're restricting this creativity a bit. With regards to creativity, change does not have to be all or nothing. It could be maybe in between. You can't aspire to be perfect in these kinds of processes because these processes are, you know, they can always be approved upon. But I think um, sometimes I say perfection is the enemy of all things good. And I think practical knowledge helps to build, and maybe little bit. It'll take a little bit of time, but it helps. And we should uh, focus our work on knowledge and experiences from the past. And I think that's more eff uh, effective if we, than if we try to create a larger idealist uh, picture of what how things should be. I think integration, lastly, is one of the most important things. And seeing it from a holistic point of view, this is also part of the whole game. I mean, I think laws by themselves do not create these uh, collective efforts to address the situation. They don't change culture. They don't change the norms. So I think integration is a powerful tool uh, for all those things that are not perhaps stated in the law or in a policy. So we also have to work within society to bring about change. There is an incredible need, even though it wasn't addressed so much this morning, and it was addressed a little bit, but we have to uh, combat those um, that brief public opinion that um, might work against them. The governments, the international uh, community, NGOs and civil society are responsible for not um, allowing these uh, uh, positions to uh, overtake their efforts. Sometimes it's, these are 
brief um, or passing uh, opinions that go against the work that we're trying to do. We also have to take into account the uh, agendas that each country has. Besides migration, they have other uh, issues that they want to uh, work upon. They have their own uh, view of how their country should look like. I'm Colombia. The peace process, for example, is an incredible priority in our agenda. We have 8 million people who have been displaced. We have millions of people who are requesting uh, permanency uh, status. We have lots of people walking along the roads, and, and they're heading towards Ecuador, which is inc an incredible scene. It's almost apocalyptic. It's like a uh, like a biblical thing. So how are you able to take all that into account and to integrate that into the agenda of a society like Colombia? Where are we headed? And I think integration is, is, is key. Roxana was talking, uh, talks a lot about that. We have perhaps certain problems in Peru, but how can we take advantage of migration to really advance the objectives that we have in mind as a society? Like, who do we want to become as a society? And I think it's an interesting aspect that we have to take into account. It could perhaps help in how efficiently we use our resources if we um, coordinate our agendas and we're able to uh, tie all our resources together and, and perhaps work in a more collaborative fashion. And I think those are the four uh, elements, and I'm sure there are others that we can add on to that. But I think those are the four main conclusions that I reached. Thank you.